We open our coverage with the announcement of a new security alliance. The United States, Britain and Australia have formed a strategic defense deal for the Indo-Pacific region. The country's leaders say the alliance will help them better share defense capabilities. But China sees things differently. Beijing criticized the new deal as damaging regional stability, and France was also left fuming, describing the pact as a stab in the back. Flanked by the British and Australian leaders, U.S. President Joe Biden announced the pact. The United States, Australia and the United Kingdom have long been faithful and capable partners, and we're even closer today. Today, we're taking another historic step to deepen and formalize cooperation among all three of our nations, <clears throat> because we all recognize the imperative of ensuring peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific over the long term. For the UK, the alliance is an important post-Brexit step. We will have a new opportunity to reinforce Britain's place at the leading edge of science and technology, strengthening our national expertise, and perhaps most significantly, the UK, Australia and the US will be joined even more closely together. China was the elephant in the room. None of the leaders mentioned the country by name, but Beijing's increasingly turbulent relationship with Canberra and China's influence in the region are thought to be the main reasons for the pact. Australia says it will now get nuclear-powered submarines. The first major initiative of AUKUS will be to deliver a nuclear-powered submarine fleet for Australia. Over the next 18 months, we will work together to seek to determine the best way forward to achieve this. But this has angered France. The Australian Navy signed a major deal with France in 2016 to build a new fleet of submarines. That deal, worth some 55 billion euros to the French, is now off. The French Foreign Minister Jean-Yves Le Drian described the move as a stab in the back and against the spirit of cooperation. China slammed the new security deal, saying it would only destabilize the region. The export of highly sensitive nuclear submarine technology by the United States and Britain to Australia shows once again they will use nuclear exports as part of a geopolitical game. It's a double standard and it's highly irresponsible. The jury's out on whether the initiative will make the seas any safer, with many fearing it could lead to a new arms race in the region. Terry Schultz is Brussels correspondent and NATO analyst, and she joins us now to provide us with some more analysis. Terry, how is NATO interpreting this trilateral security alliance? Hi, Leila. I don't think NATO is interpreting it as a security alliance. I think they see it more as a defense arrangement, a deal, in fact, even a boost to security for everyone. NATO and Australia have a very good relationship, of course, Australia not being a member. But I think um, that NATO sees this as a way to uh, enhance security in the South China Sea. China has become an increasingly important security concern for NATO just in the last couple of years in particular. And I think they're seeing it Positively, I spoke with an official earlier today who said it's not raising any concern at NATO headquarters whatsoever. In fact, it will probably be seen as a positive. This hasn't gone down well with France, though. <laughs> yeah, that's an understatement. France is furious. Uh, it, it lost uh, tens of billions of euros in this submarine deal that Australia has now canned. And of course, France doesn't like to not be consulted. I mean, no European country wants to wants to be left out, but France certainly considers itself, you know, a player. It doesn't like it when, when it doesn't get any word whatsoever that this is happening. But France isn't the only one. You know, uh, Joseph Borrell, the EU foreign policy chief, just said um, a short time ago today, Day, that he hadn't been consulted, that he didn't know anything about the deal, and that it must have been in the works for some time. So he clearly wasn't pleased either, but certainly not as outraged as France, whose foreign minister went so far as to say this reminded him of the Trump years. Going forward, in terms of uh, defense strategy, does the EU need to rethink its reliance on the U.S. again, uh, become more autonomous, contribute more actively? 
Layla, you and I have discussed this many times over the years. The U.S. has been calling on the EU to become more autonomous for a long time. It doesn't like carrying the weight of every operation that NATO undertakes. It would like to see the EU uh, be able to sort of to provide more of its own security, to have better funded militaries, for example. But I don't think it's this defense deal that's going to be pushing that so much as the debacle that we've seen unfolding in Afghanistan. That really has been the impetus for the EU. To, to look more closely now at improving its own uh, decision-making infrastructure, its intelligence sharing, uh, and its ability to launch perhaps even expeditionary operations on its own, which would have, for example, allowed them to evacuate more people uh, from Kabul airport after the U.S. pulled out. So I think that truly will be more of a motivating factor mm -hmm. than, than this new arrangement. How does the European Union see the rise of China, especially, you know, how does it assess its ability to navigate an increasingly bipolar world that is defined by U.S.-China rivalry? Certainly, the EU does not see it as uh, the China relationship is, as as black and white as the United States does, and that puts Europe in an uncomfortable position with the United States uh, in in many aspects, in commercially, also uh, in a defense in a defense uh, aspect, because the U.S. very much would like Europe to take the American side um, and and see China as as primarily a threat, not a partner, not a commercial partner, as many EU countries do. But we have. Seen Seen over the last couple of years, particularly with aggressive actions by China, that the EU is moving more close, uh, moving more closely to the to the U.S. point of view. At the same time, I don't think you're ever going to see the European Union take such a stark view of Beijing as the U.S. does. Teres Schultz is Brussels correspondent and NATO analyst. Thank you. To France's alliance now with Germany, which, unlike its ties with Washington, looks in good shape. German Chancellor Angela Merkel is in Paris for her final visit before leaving office. She's meeting France's President Emmanuel Macron for a working dinner at the presidential palace. The two leaders are tackling some of Europe and the world's most pressing problems. On the agenda? the crisis in Afghanistan, the EU's vexed relations with neighbor Belarus, and the leader's plans for addressing climate change. And DW's Alexander von Naumann is in front of the Elysee Palace in Paris. She is covering the Chancellor's farewell uh, visit. Alexander, how much of a cloud has the new security alliance between the United States, Britain and Australia cast over this meeting? You know, Leila, this is really difficult to say, and, and I found it quite interesting that the French president didn't talk about the topic. He didn't mention this cancel deal with, with a word during their press statements, and he must be angry or at least disappointed, uh, and that how his ministers um, expressed their feelings. Uh, it was Angela Merkel who talked about that, who mentioned the topic, saying that they are definitely going to talk about the Indo-Pacific region, their uh, relationship with China, and also the transatlantic relationship. Alexander, let's focus now on uh, this uh, meeting. Um, uh, president Macron is the fourth French president that Chancellor Merkel has worked with. How would you characterize their relationship? I think that they uh, they seem to have a very good working relationship. I mean, at the beginning, they had, uh, I would say, some, some initial problems. They uh, had to get used to their different styles. We know that Angela Merkel is a very cautious, restrained politician, and uh, Emmanuel Macron uh, likes to see change happening immediately, and he's sometimes very enthusiastic about bold ideas. But, of course, both leaders know that their relationship relationship is very important for the whole European Union, uh, that this Franco-German relationship is uh, the engine of the European Union. If it works well, then the European Union moves forward. If not, if it doesn't, then the European Union stalls. Uh, so uh, this was the case for um, all the French presidents that Angela Merkel had uh, to work with. She was always trying to have a good working relationship with them. However, we also know that uh, the French president is going to miss her. Uh, that what uh, he said, and uh, he also described her as uh, his friend. 
in, in conclusion, Alexandra, what would you say was the most defining moment of the Merkel-Macron era? Well, I think that the most defining moment was clearly the moment where they were able to agree how to combat the economic fallout of the COVID crisis, of the coronavirus crisis. It was the French president who helped persuade Angela Merkel to agree to a massive COVID recovery package that is going to be financed by joint EU debt. And and that was previously incredible uh, to, to see from, from a conservative German leader. And I think this was the, the most important moment of the Merkel-Macron um, Merkel era. DW's Alexander von Namen reporting on Merkel's farewell visit to France, reporting from in front of the Elysee Palace in Paris. Thank you so very much.